what would gravity feel like on another planet? I wanted to show my kids what gravity was like throughout the solar system, so I built this device here that simulates rolling a ball back and forth, but in a different planet. So they can try and balance this ball on the surface of the sun, or on Pluto, or on any other type of planet. See, when NASA wants to simulate different levels of gravity, they put things on a parabolic flight, or in a buoyancy tank, or they use some sort of set of harnesses and robot arms to simulate low gravity. This was all a little bit out of the family budget, but I still wanted my kids to be able to imagine and visualize, interact with gravity on different types of planets. And so this device, I think, is kind of a cool way to do that. In this video, we're gonna talk about how gravity works on different planets. We're gonna talk about the design of this device, and then we're gonna talk about the math and then the code that enables us to simulate different levels of gravity. Let's talk a little bit about the science of gravity on different planets. The attraction, the gravitational force between any two masses is given by this equation here. And so the gravitational force depends on the distance between the objects and both masses. On a planet, we can essentially lump the mass of the planet and the size of the planet into kind of this one parameter that defines the gravitational constant or the force due to gravity on that planet. And you can see here that it depends both on the planet's mass and on the planet's size or the location where you're at. So for example, Jupiter is like over 300 times more mass, has 300 times more mass than Earth. But the gravity on Jupiter is only about two and a half times bigger than it is here on Earth because Jupiter is much bigger. For my demo, I didn't want to replicate the gravity of every single planet, even though it's, it's only changing a number in the code. But I tried to choose a representative set. So I chose Pluto as a low gravity example. I chose Mars because we hear a lot about Mars. I chose Earth as a good comparison. Neptune as a slightly heavier, uh, more gravity example, and then Neptune, and then Jupiter, and then the Sun as the examples that, that I'll use, although we could easily simulate the gravity for any of these planets. Let's talk about the physical design of the device, which is actually relatively simple. The main component is just this long strip of NeoPixels that we can control programmatically, and I think I have like a six-foot strip with 60 NeoPixels, but you could use any density, really. Um, the only other component is that we essentially have this circuit board that's controlling things here. The important part is that I'm using an Arduino. This is the Arduino Nano 33 BLE. What matters is that it has an embedded IMU in it. So it's able to measure the tilt of the device and we're gonna use that in our math and in our computations later. I'm not gonna talk too much about the circuit here today. Essentially, I just followed the NeoPixel guide from Adafruit. It essentially talks about how to build the circuit. All that's really special going on here is there's a logic shifter that's shifting the level of the logic. Um, there's some capacitors and resistors that just kind of smooth out the signals. Um, it could be a lot cleaner, it's kind of messy. The only other thing that you need for this device is some way to attach the strip of NeoPixels in the circuit board. Um, in this case, I'm just using this two inch PVC pipe because I had it sitting around in my garage. It's not very elegant, but you could use any structural member that you could rigidly mount the, the um, IMU to, because you'll need it rigidly connected to the device, and then some way to mount the NeoPixels. All right, let's find some equations of motion for this thing. We're gonna start with a simple case and then incrementally add more features to it. So for now, let's assume that we're just looking at a block sliding back and forth around a ramp. And for now, let's make the huge assumption that the angle theta is going to be fixed. So we're just looking at a block sliding down a, down a fixed ramp, basically. What are the forces acting on the block? Well, the only force acting on the block is gravity, which is going to have magnitude mass times gravity. And we could decompose it into two elements here, one that's into the ramp, one that's along a ramp. And if this angle in here is theta, we can get this component here is going to be mg sine of theta. And so if we were going to apply Newton's law the sum of all the forces equals mass times acceleration. Let's define the mass's position with our variable x. And this is what we're going to use to actually turn on the lights um, as we're going. So what we can say is we can say the mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces, which in this case is only going to be minus mg sine of theta. And so that would be our equation of motion if the ramp were not moving. Let's add a little bit of complexity. Let's say that the ramp is in fact moving, so our theta becomes theta of t in this case. So I'm gonna say down here, theta of t. Now if the ramp is rotating, um, that's gonna cause one additional force, which is essentially gonna be our, our centripetal force right here, which is gonna be m theta dot squared times x. 
And this is a, it's an inertial force. Um, it's essentially the force you feel as you're swinging around a bucket of water, pulling, pulling back to the middle. And so in this case, the faster that I am spinning the ramp, the block is going to want to slide further out. And so if I repeat, if I sum up all the forces, I'm going to get that M X double dot is equal to the same thing, negative M G sine of theta. But now I'm going to have plus M X theta dot squared. And so now I have a more complex equation of motion that accounts for the effect of the moving of the moving mass. Now to solve this equation, what I need to know is I need to know the angle and I need to know the angular velocity. And I can compute both of those from the IMU that is inside the microcontroller. So I have access to both of these. And then of course the gravity is something that I could just control and code. So I can simulate gravity on different planets. Another interesting thing here is that you can see that all the masses cancel. Um, however, we're gonna do one other thing first. What happens is that if I consider this to be a rolling ball instead of a mass, um, we're going to make a slight modification to this term right here, the inertia, um, the inertia of the system. So let's talk about that, and then we'll come back and end up with a combined equation here. Now let's talk about the difference between assuming that we have a sliding mass versus a rolling ball. Now, if they have the same mass, you might think that there's no difference between these two cases, but there is actually an important conceptual difference. When I push this mass, all the energy directly goes into the translation of the mass. But if this ball is rolling, when I push the ball, some of the energy is going to go into rotation and some of the energy is going to go into translation. So conceptually, it's almost as if this ball has a higher effective mass than just the translating object. And we can quantify that. And one way to do so is to look at the kinetic energy of the two systems. So if we look at the kinetic energy of this ball or of this mass over here, it's pretty easy. One half m x dot squared is the kinetic energy of this thing. So we'll say Ke of the square. If we look at the kinetic energy of the rolling sphere, we're going to have two terms. We're going to have a one half m x dot squared. But then we're also going to have a one half i omega squared if we assume that omega is the rotational rate of the sphere. And if the sphere is rolling without slipping, we also have a nice relationship here between the translation of the sphere is going to equal the angular rate times the radius. So this is called a kinematic relationship. It tells us the relationship between how it's spinning and how it's translating. So what we can do now is we can make the substitution of this into this equation right here and get everything in terms of one nice um, variable, which is x dot. And what I'm also going to do is I'm also going to kind of make the substitution here that i for a sphere is going to be 2 fifths m r squared. That's the moment of inertia of a sphere about its, about its center. All right, and so if I make the substitution here, I can end up with a nice relationship for kinetic energy. The first term is gonna be unchanged, one half mx squared plus one half i, I'm gonna plug in my two fifths mr squared. And then I'm also gonna solve for omega. So omega is x dot over r. So I can end up with an x dot squared over r squared. And we see right away that those r squareds are going to cancel. Now, the interesting thing about this here is I have this x dot squared in both terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the x dot squared. And I'm going to write this as if it were a kinetic energy. So I'm going to leave a one half out front. I'm going to put a bunch of terms in the middle. And then I'm going to put an x dot squared at the end. And just going through the math here, I'm going to get m plus two-fifths m x dot squared gives me the kinetic energy of the rolling ball. And you'll see that this term right here acts just like a mass in our kinetic expression, kinetic energy expression. And what we call that is an effective mass. Effectively, when I'm pushing the sphere, it's acting in one degree of freedom. It's acting as a single object. But the mass we feel when we push the sphere, that gravity feels when it pulls the sphere, 
is essentially m plus two fifths m, so seven fifths m. So pushing this ball to accelerate it, it takes seven fifths more force than just pushing the mass back and forth. And so what we can do is we can take this effective mass term, the seven fifths m, and plug it back into our mass term on our equation of motion. And that will give us the equations as if it's a rolling sphere as opposed to a sliding mass. When we put all of that together, we end up with this equation of motion right here. And now our goal is to integrate this or solve this equation of motion over a period of time to find the position of the ball. And so what we're gonna do is the state, or we fully define the system, if we keep track of the position of the ball and the velocity of the ball. These are the two terms that describe the full energy, the kinetic and potential energy of the system. And so our goal is somehow to take the current position and the current velocity, and we want to find the position and the velocity at the next time step. So this is what we want to be doing over and over as the ball is rolling back and forth. And the way we're going to do that is we are going to integrate this differential equation. We're going to multiply by some time step times the rate of change of each of these components here. So we want to somehow multiply the time step by a, a function for xi dot and then xi double dot, multiply that by the time step, and then add that to the current state to find the state at the next time step. It's basically saying if I know where I'm at and how fast I'm going, and I know how fast I'm going and how fast I'm accelerating, I can figure out where I'm at and how fast I am at the next time step. And so the only complicated part, we already know... Um, xi dot. The only complicated part is finding the acceleration, but that is what we're going to get from the equation of motion right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for xi double dot, and if we solve for this, we are essentially going to get this expression right here. So I'm solving for xi dot. I'm going to bring the x theta dot squared term over to this side, and then I'm going to subtract the g sine of theta of t term. And then I'm going to divide all of that by 7 fifths, or we can also say multiply that by 5 sevenths. And I end up with an expression that tells me how the ball is accelerating. And it's a function of essentially two things, the angular velocity, and I can measure this directly with an accelerometer or with the, the IMU that's included in the Arduino. Um, and then also the tilt, which I'm also going to measure from the Arduino. And it's interesting, the only other parameter that really shows up in here is the, the gravity. So that's what I'm going to change when I simulate the gravity on different planets. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to plug it in here, and then in my code I'm going to solve this over and over and over again as a function of how fast the thing is rotating and the position of my the, the board I'm balancing. And that's going to allow me to track both where the ball is and how fast it's moving and allow me to do it in a physically realistic sense. I'll make the code available, so I don't want to talk too much about all the nitty gritty of the code here. But I'm going to point out a couple of things. First off, here's the numerical integration, which you can kind of see reflected from the equations that we just derived. Um, another interesting thing is once we know the position of the ball, we've got to figure out which light to light up. And at first I did that just by picking the closest light. Um, with this round function here. And you can kind of see the resultant behavior here is relatively choppy. I wanted to improve this a little bit. So I came up with this smoothing term where I basically smoothly move the brightness from one pixel to another. And that I think gives like a much better representation of the continuous motion that we're trying to simulate here. In the code, changing the gravity is as simply as just changing this G parameter. And so what I do is I have the ball every 10 seconds, I essentially switch gravity and I can switch through any predefined number of gravity levels. So with that all set up, let's go ahead and take a little tour of the solar system, see what gravity is like on different planets. Hey.
what might future work look like for this device? A couple of things, and we'll start with the most practical and then go to maybe the most exciting but hardest to do. So a practical thing, it'd be really nice to make this more transportable. Right now it's really big and bulky, but that's mostly just because of this PVC pipe. So I think in finding some way to like, you know, roll up the LEDs on like a tape measure or something like that, that makes them deployable, could make this a pretty portable device. One idea that could make this more interesting is to change the game instead of just trying to keep the virtual ball balanced on this thing, is to give it targets that you want to hit. So for example, you could light up different targets along the light strip. And then your challenge is to get the ball to those targets without rolling off the edges. It could just make it a little more interesting, um, more interactive to play. And finally, the coolest thing that I think would be cool future work for this is that if you replace the lights with an actual cart, like that was, you know, had a motor pulling it back and forth. Then you could play the same game, but you could actually feel the weight of the cart moving back and forth along as you were trying to balance it. And so right now you kind of get the sense you can visually see the ball move, but if you could feel the ball move, that would be an even cooler gravity simulator. So let me know if you have any other good ideas for future work. So thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And then this is also the first time that I've made a video like this. So I would love to hear any feedback or suggestions that people have. And I would also appreciate it if you subscribe so you can follow along to see future things like this, trying to combine some engineering and some parenting uh, to do some fun projects. With that, have a good one.